Professor Ho, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this interview series. The first thing I should say is how honored I am, especially since you are presently the director of the, the China Christianity Studies Group, CCSG, and have lended the name of CCSG to be one of the co-supporters of this, this series. And, um, and not only are we happy that uh, you're being part of this uh, series and, and a supporter, but, but also uh, representing, uh, um, I would say, a, a generation of newer scholars to the field of the study of Christianity in China. And I think you've been in Albion now for, is this your second year? Uh, it's going to be my, going to my fourth year. Fourth year, goodness, yeah. time passes quickly. Well, already, yeah, oh, yeah. already, you've you've published a, a marvelous chapter in the book uh, uh, China Christianity, China's Christianity. You co-edited a volume on a, an American missionary, his letters, a, a compendium of his letters at Hangzhou, <laughs> and you just announced to me before we began this interview that your monograph is to be published. That is great news on American China missionary films and photography. Can you tell us the title of that and the press? Sure. Uh, so it's going to be with Cornell University Press, and the title is "Developing Mission: Photography, Filmmaking, and American Missions in Mod uh, American Missionaries in Modern China." Excellent. And and well, you you just are now beginning production, so um, mm -hmm. we know how how that can occupy one's time. So. Thank you for taking time for this interview. Let's just begin with the first question. Um, so, so we're asking everyone, as you know, the same questions. And uh, the first question is really what brought you, Professor Ho, to the field of China Christianity Studies? And if you could also uh, provide a few remarks on why you're interested specifically in the areas about which you've conducted your research. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I think um, it, it was it's a number of intersecting experiences. And the first one being family. Um, my family, at least from my dad's side, it comes from a long, longer history of, of um, Chinese Catholicism, um, being uh, members of the Catholic Church in China um, for many, many generations. Um, and my mother is a, a newer convert to Christianity um, and um, you know, from Taiwan coming here and became a member of a, a church here in the United States. But I think it was growing up in a Chinese Christian environment that really for me didn't have a lot of immediate history. It was more family experiences, going to church, um, but then kind of slowly recovering these experiences, stories from my family that eventually led me to um, thinking about recovering this history. And I like to say that I, I often am searching still for my grandparents' experiences in the research that I do and the, and the stories that I try to tell um, but it was that experience growing up as a Chinese Christian in the United States, um, or Chinese American Christian, plus the uh, undergraduate experience, um, learning about modern Chinese history, becoming a history major, um, pursuing um, studies that I, I'd wanted to do in kind of modern Chinese history, and bringing that together with my interest in photography, in cameras, um, in film, and putting all those together and realizing that there is this unexplored or underexplored history of visual practices among um, the history of Christianity, in the history of Christianity in China and the history of modern Chinese um, experience, um, bringing those all together that really sparked my interest going forward. And I know also that you've had a number of discoveries of, of things such as missionary films and, and photography. And I, and so that's a discover of an object that perhaps has nuanced your understanding of your topic. I wonder if you might sort of discuss or, or, or um, um, describe those discoveries or perhaps even mention if, if you've had a specific discovery in your research that has changed how you thought about your topic. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, and, there, and there are many of these. I think it's hard to nail down one specific um, kind of discovery, but I feel like it's finding that missionaries wrote so many things about using cameras, about photography, about film, that they were thinking about media and ways of transmitting and translating their experiences into visual material um, that, that really kind of brought me into this world and, and realizing that missionaries, uh, along with Chinese Christians, also produced or participated in all of these image making experiences um, and that they, they produced all of these 
photos and, and film, and there's millions of these, I mean, hundreds of thousands, certainly. Um, and, and all of this was untapped. And I think uh, in terms of the kind of one-on-one -on -one experiences I've had, you know, encountering missionary families, um, children who still have, you know, the photos and films of their, um, you know, parents um, entering archives and finding, um, you know, films sitting there or, or photo albums, um, experiences that you share, Tony, um, in recovering these materials and realizing, my goodness, this is a window onto this history that um, has, has been around, you know, for decades, and yet no one, uh, or very few people have looked specifically at these images as that window. Um, and finally, you know, kind of encountering along the way the, the kind of uh, the, the traces or material artifacts that come out of this experience, including um, cameras like, like this um, that, have, that have been used to produce these movies and have been passed down from, you know, person to person. Um, and then thinking about how these technologies impact the ways that these experiences are shaped and produced um, are all part of this research experience. I'm going to sway a little bit. I'll go back to our planned questions, but sure, sure. Inspired, I think uh, something that so so many of us who studied Christianity in China are aware of, and that is one that the study of Christianity in China has not been a very large group in the scholarly community, and it's growing exponentially now. But certainly, uh, Professor Ho, Joe, you are uh, Joseph. You are actually a pioneer in this new emerging interest in the visual culture, especially film and um, film and, and, and photograph. I wonder if you might just add a few notes about how that came about specifically and how your scholarly work with visual images, uh, what, is, what is particularly new about this? Sure, so uh, at least for how this uh, came about, um, for me, tinkering with cameras in, that my family had and finding photo albums, just in general, photography being part of, um, you know, a huge part of 20th century experience in general. And then finding that, you know, these are really cool things that these, um, these machines, these uh, instruments are su a, such a, you know, intimate part of the way that we think about our own history and how we think about our families and the way we see the world. And then finding that that experience was not so much different from um, Chinese Christians and missionaries and other participants in this history who thought of themselves also as producing and recording their experiences in images. Um, and, and I feel like because this is, this is an angle and this is a dimension um, that, uh, that adds so much depth to the already very rich field of thinking about the intersections of theology, of literature, of gender, um, of cross-cultural experience, and then seeing, the idea of seeing and making visible the um, experiences that, and beliefs that may not be readily visible in other ways is really this exciting, uh, challenging, and wide open field um, that I believe would, would be, is, is great uh, and, and adds a lot of dimension to this approach. One, one great thing about, you know, I've seen you lecture um, before at conferences and certainly here at my university. One of the, the exciting things that, that are, maybe you experience this too, is that uh, when you teach East Asian history, sort of the pre-photograph era is, is, is great. But when you show them their first photograph of someone they're reading about, there's some kind of mm -hmm. excitement. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> the people of history really adds a whole new dimension that almost it, it sort of intrigues students at a higher level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the philosopher Roland Barth writes about this idea that the photograph is a has been, that that thing or that person or that place was in front of the lens, that light rays bounced off of that and went onto the film. And you're seeing, again, that window right into history. Um, I love to describe it as the closest thing we have to time travel um, because you can place yourself closer to that history that we're looking at. Right. Now, um, the next question then is, is, and then you can answer this as you wish, but can you describe one of the most meaningful moments you've had um, conducting research in China or perhaps in another place? Or I, mean, I know that some interviewees have offered several places that they've had <laughs> a particularly a powerful experiences, but, but could you reflect upon something that was particularly meaningful to you in experiencing during your research? Sure. So for example, in, in another place. Sure. Uh, 
So I think one, one very vivid memory that comes to mind um, is going to China for re kind of in-depth research for the first time. And uh, this was in 2011 and traveling to the city where um, this movie camera made its images in 1935. And I had never been there and only read about it. Um, I had lived kind of in the world of that city, uh, city of Xintai uh, in Hebei. Um, and going to the church where the missionaries who owned this camera had worked and seeing for the first time the environment, how different it was and how unexpectedly different. Um, the you know, things I had this whole imagination um, in my mind about what it would look like. It was nothing like that. You know, huge streets, tremendous developments, and then how, meeting these descendants of Chinese Christians, members of the church, who took me around, showing me the traces of the old mission, um, a house that had been built up around with these big skyscrapers on either side, and the girls' school still in the middle, um, but untouched, basically un unrestored, um, and then seeing one of the remaining houses where one of the missionary photographers that I um, wrote about and read about had made his images in the basement of, and this house was now a little clubhouse for a PLA veterans club. Um, and then being asked by these uh, uh, um, um, people I, I was interviewing, would you like to have lunch? And I said, of course, that's great. Let's take a break. Let's go to, for lunch. And he said, let's go to the restaurant next door. And we walked around the corner from the church and the restaurant was the, the, in the building that used to, used to contain the hospital where the medical missionary who owned this, this camera um, had you know, taken care of his patients. And we sat in the building that was once the hospital eating lunch and conversing. And I, I felt overwhelmed by the sense of history and relationship um, and this kind of built environment that was now bleeding from the past into the present. Um, in the voices and the, the form of this, uh, this place. Can you tell us who the missionary was? Who owned the camera? Sure. Yeah, so this camera, um, and this camera was passed on to me by the family after I finished my PhD. Um, the missionaries who owned this camera were Dr. Harold Hankey and um, Jesse May Hankey, who was a registered nurse, and um, their son, Richard Hankey, also Dr. Hankey, um, was the one who gave me this camera. And he's a dear friend of mine. Um, and again, it's a reminder that this history is lived. It's a history of family, of relationships, um, and of personal experience. Right. Um, things like uh, cameras are not often, cameras of missionaries are not often found in archives for us historians. It's mostly text, some images, right. but cameras, that's a whole new thing. And, and two, you mentioned these experiences that you've had uh, in, in, in China, in Hebei, uh, my students always think who travel to China that it's, there's nothing, a PowerPoint will never replace actually being there mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the context of that historical thing we're studying. Um, you know, we're asking all of the scholars, and we have quite a bit of time left, so we're asking all of the scholars to, to answer one question in particular, and that is, we're obviously most interested in you, but um, we're asking all of the, the, the scholars to maybe reflect upon someone else. And I wonder if you could recall a pleasant or significant memory you've had regarding another scholar in our field, um, something that you think should be remembered uh, just within the chronology of history of our field of the study of Christianity in China. Sure. So, uh, I mean, of course, I could talk a lot about you and uh, our experiences and how the friendship has grown and um, and certainly all the support that you've rendered um, to emerging scholars, younger scholars um, like, like me and many others. Um, and kind of inviting, in how you invited me to Whitworth and uh, introduced me to a wonderful community of scholars and friends and colleagues um, in, in, your, in your area. Um, so certainly I would talk, I could talk more about you and <laughs> how much this has really um, been a wonderful experience. Uh, another person really who uh, has been tremendously influential is uh, Wu Xiaoxin, um, Xiaoxin Wu, um, at the Ricci Institute, and remembering how I, again, one of these encounters, going to the Ricci Institute for the first time and being in awe of the material that they had there and you know, the paintings of Ricci, um, Xu Guangxi, and then seeing um, this man come out from the doors and with a big smile on his face, kind of walk forward and then greet me and then kind of 
pull me into this world <laughs> of, of amazing material and, and wonderful knowledge and uh, uh, undergirding all of that with this sincere, warm, and engaging friendship. Um, and, and he talks about, Xiao Xin will talk about the Reaching Institute and um, the kind of community of scholars as a family. And I, I've mentioned family so many times this in this kind of uh, little interview already, but it's really that, that um, it's built on relationships and he exemplifies that and has this wonderful rich knowledge of the ways that Christianity in China is so diverse. It's tr completely global and he lives that. Certainly. Um, well, you mentioned um, Wu Xiaoxin and the Ricci Institute. I, I wonder if no one has talked about so far the Ricci Institute other than Wu Xiaoxin himself a little. I wonder if you might say something about um, what your experience was there at the, at the Ricci Institute and how that perhaps enhanced your scholarship. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the, the, for the Rishi Institute, um, I was working on material that is a little bit different from what the Institute typically specializes in, uh, and the Institute, of course, is covering, and I which mean, I will have said, um, you know, Ming Dynasty, Qing Dynasty, Jesuit encounters with China. Um, I was looking at photographs. I was looking at photographs made by American Passionist missionaries um, that were being digitized at the Rishi Institute um, in collaboration with Father Robert Carboneau. Um, who, again, is a wonderful friend and was the second person I met after I met Xiaoxin that very same day. Um, and I could say much more about Father Rob, too. Um, but the photographs that they have there um, and have digitized are a tremendously rich resource for the study of Christianity in China and modern China itself in the 20th century, um, along with um, they have tens of thousands, um, at least several thousand color slides from Jesuit missions across East Asia after 1950. Um, and those have definitely not been explored um, in any substantial way that I know of. Um, so that's kind of one of my future projects and I encourage other people who are listening in to explore the Rishi Institute that way. And finally, finding a 16 millimeter color film shot by Jesuits in Yangzhou in 1948, just sitting there. Um, it had been taken out by uh, Mark Mir, who is a wonderful guy and an amazing archivist and knows everything. Um, and that film was there and had just been stored at the Reach Institute. So it's a, a real treasure trove of material relating to this history. Mm -hmm. well, there wasn't there another film other than the Yangzhou that you also discovered? Yes, so there was Yangzhou 1948, which was um, more of this kind of uh, documentary, um, but there was a formal documentary called Ageless China that had been put together by a, a Jesuit priest named um, Bernard, Bernard Hubbard, um, Father Bernard Hubbard, um, who had visited China and then was um, involved in making documentaries around the world. I mean, he, was, he cut his teeth on documentary in Alaska and was known as the Glacier Priest, but had been invited by the Jesuits to come to China at the pivotal moment of 1948 to make a film. And he put it together with sound narration, um, with music, and it's a kind of companion piece to Yangzhou 1948. And I write about this in the last chapter of my book. It's, that's upcoming with Cornell. That's correct. Yeah. Well, uh, we have one other question, unless we can think of something in addition, and that might happen. But I wonder if, and this is the question that many have said is the most difficult. Um, and some have, have uh, have even been rather stumped. What, what are, what are my hopes for the future? But, but as a scholar and, and, and as one who has, has met um, several of the so-called senior scholars um, and also is very well connected with, uh, with more junior scholars, as we say in our field, um, what hopes do you have for the future of, of the field of the study of Christianity in China? Sure. I would say it's utilizing the materials that, that are now really, there are so, there's so much. Use, utilizing this rich resource of material that is coming to the fore, that is being digitized um, by people like you, um, by institutes like the Ricci, um, and perhaps focusing on the ways that this material intersects with different kinds of history that perhaps you know, grow out of this um, existing field of China Christianity studies. They're perhaps thinking, and, and I might be self-serving here, but thinking about the history of technology and how media and transmission of information 
um, is fundamentally part of this history. How we can continue to explore how communities in China today um, are connected to their legacies and their futures and um, you know, their kind of the, the communities that exist across time by technology um, and by media. And thinking about other ways that we can expand this field in a way that it's not just a subfield, it's not just a, a specific um, way of approaching studies that is just about Christianity in China, but it is about China in the world and about the world and global encounters and transnational histories that, that overlap with Christianity in China and making that this field even richer and even more diverse when it comes to the approaches that we take to um, the history and the material, building upon um, existing scholarship, but then thinking about the ways that um, this is a story of China and this is the story of the world in China and multiple worlds within it. And I feel like that's a way of um, looking forward, at least in a, a general sense that I, I see for this field. Enmeshed with your hopes, which are that these rich materials are utilized more, enmeshed with those hopes, do you have advice? And I, and I ask this question because, for example, uh, most scholars who have written in the, in the past have written largely on pre-modern, pre-1949 history. Um, even mostly in, in, in late Ming and, and Qing texts. Um, and so with this emerging group of scholars who want to look at photographs, want to look at films, what advice do you have for accessing and what advice do you have for, for having some sort of hermeneutic approach to how to think about them? Mm -hmm. Sure. So in terms of access, um, use resources like the Samist collection that you have, that Tony Clark has just put together. Um, use resources at the Rishi, at the Yale Divinity School. There are hundreds of thousands of images waiting to be explored. And I, every time I look at a new collection, I feel overwhelmed that this could be, you know, five times a life's work in looking at all these images and seeing what stories they tell. So the, the materials are there. Um, look for them, look for images, look for um, materials and texts that talk about image making and visuality and how these people approached and uh, communities approached these images. And in terms of a broader kind of a methodological question, um, think about these images as mediation. And it's, it's a lovely word, it, it of course plays on media. Um, I love uh, the Canadian theorist, uh, philosopher Marshall McLuhan, who talked about um, the medium is the message. Think about that, how this is mediating memory, experience, space, and time, and how these frames, these images, um, are, are again windows and lenses that we can look through to see parts of this history. Uh, it's, I, I, um, I'm happy you mentioned Marshall McLuhan, someone that I quite love to read and the, his book, The Medium is the Message. My students struggle with it until they get halfway through and then they rather find that it, it really does open a whole new purview of thinking about, about even just writing. Um, mm -hmm. Well, uh, I guess then, uh, is there anything in addition to what you've already noted uh, in terms of in terms of, uh, well, I guess that what I'm trying to think here about here is what you've mes me mentioned is that there are sources that one can access. Um, and I guess I would respond just a, a little with, with, with thinking about mainland China and how mainland has had a, a recent history of certain struggles and challenges in accessing these, these kinds of materials. Um, and I know that uh, when, and perhaps when you've spoken in China, when I've spoken in China, if I show a slide of a photograph, there, there is a, a myriad, myriad cell phones come yeah, up that's and right. take yes. photographs of it. Yes, what, yes. Sort of, as we consider concluding here in the next five or six minutes, if you might reflect upon the field that, that you really find yourself within vis-a-vis um, -vis mainland China and how mainland China might might move forward. Sure. I feel like it's, re it's, it's recovering its history. And, and this is, you know, the, it's, I feel like part of the impetus behind the raising of iPhones and cameras to get those images is that 
they are reconnecting. People in mainland China are reconnecting with these histories and they too have these materials and they may not be easily accessible to foreign scholars like, like us. Um, they may not even be accessible to people within China. So I think for, I guess my encouragement for um, scholars who are based in mainland China is to look, look at archives here and, and, and you've already, you're doing, already doing that, but to be able to broaden the horizons um, and, and continue recovering that history. Um, and I feel like in, in the same way, these images speak back to experiences that have been obscured, sometimes destroyed, sometimes lost. Um, and the more that we can do as scholars to build those bridges um, between communities in mainland China um, who may or may not have access to their materials or materials that, are, are, that illuminate their history, and uh, the more that we can make those accessible from where we are and the materials that we work with, the more, the better this will be for everyone and for this history. So then let me, let's end on one last unprompted question. And that is what's next for you in terms of your own scholarly enterprise? What, 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 what projects do you envision in your near future? Sure. So uh, uh, the big one, and it's still kind of a dream at this moment. Uh, I've been collecting bits and pieces of it um, over the past couple of years is a history of Catholic missionary um, media activities in Cold War Taiwan. Mm. And um, I tentatively have it titled The Bamboo Wireless because it's uh, <laughs> the name of this magazine that uh, I found in, in uh, the Taipei um, Jesuit office. And uh, thinking about how Cold War Taiwan is a place of kind of reimagined and reconfigured encounters between um, missions, media, and local communities. Um, was a place where these things like, uh, you know, um, Uncle Jerry's Guangxi电台, you know, English language TV um, program and uh, Jesuit missions, uh, missionaries who were stationed as chaplains on the island of Jinmen uh, with cameras, um, also envisioned their place in the world and their encounters with uh, Taiwan and um, people of Chinese descent. So um, that's kind of the next project, along with a couple of small things, uh, working with Daryl Ireland on a book on Chinese Christian posters um, and their kind of presence in visual culture. And, and Daryl's the, I mean, he's the guy who's taking care of this. I'm just contributing a chapter, but things here and there to, to keep things going. Um, but it's been so much fun. It's been very exciting. Well, um, Dr. Ho, we look forward to all of those projects. Um, and, uh, one of the things that I really shared with you is this love for the visual history of, of China, Christianity in China. And Taiwan is, is a significant place that hasn't been, hasn't been studied enough. I'm happy to hear of that project. With that, um, thank you so much. Uh, we are so grateful. And I know that you're in Michigan now, uh, uh, entering in nicer weather than you typically have in the winter months. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> so. We all wish you the very best of summers, and we wish you the Shanti Jen Kang, the very best of health. But thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me.